This is Duke University. Hello, my name is Beverly McKeever, and I'm the Espen Shade Professor of the Practice here at Duke University. Um, I teach painting in the School of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies. Uh, I stand before you to introduce you to uh, my new BFF, <laughs> Lorna Simpson. Lorna was born in Brooklyn, New York, and received her BFA in photography from the School of Visual Arts in New York. Her MFA uh, she received from the University of California in San Diego. Uh, she's known for her large-scale photographs and text work. The work confronts and challenges conventional views of gender, identity, culture, history, and memory. Lorna uses the figure to examine the ways in which gender and culture shape the interaction, relationship, and experience of our lives in America. In the last 15 years, uh, Lorna has turned to film and video, creating works in which individuals engage in conversation that seem to address the mysteries of both identity and desire. Uh, her work has been exhibited everywhere. <laughs> the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Miami Art Museum, the Walker Center, uh, in Minneapolis and several other prestigious venues, both in, here in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, she is also the subject of numerous articles. I didn't write them all down because I thought you could look that up online. <laughs> Catalog, essays, and books. So today uh, I was putting together this this morning and. I decided to call Lorna's gallery to see if I could say something personal to make her human. And they were like, uh, we don't know you. <laughs> you know, we'll give Lorna your phone number and maybe she'll call you back. <laughs> so they did, and uh, about five minutes later, Lorna called me, and I ended up having lunch with her. And I said, Lorna, you know, you don't know me. My name is Beverly, and I'm at Duke, and I want to say something that makes you human. <laughs> And she laughed at me. <laughs> and then after she laughed, she said, oh, I have a 17-year-old daughter who's looking at colleges and is going to take the SAT test tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, it's driving me crazy. And my response to her was, wow, that's a great response. And a 17-year-old definitely makes you human. It's my pleasure to introduce and share with you Lorna Simpson. Thank you, Beverly, for such a warm welcome. And thank you all for being here tonight. Um, yes, having someone who is applying to colleges and this whole process has really taken me aback. <laughs> Um, in the kind of psychological management of these teenagers at all seem like the world is coming to an end on a particular kind of um, decision when it's really the beginning of one's life and college is only this mechanism to help you find what speaks to you. Um, but you would think my child would know that. <laughs> um, so tonight I thought I would kind of give an overview of the work that I've done that's gone from photography to video to film to drawings to collage to now um, mo more recently um, works on gesso, it's a kind of more painting, which has been fun and really interesting. But I thought I'd go through kind of the different stages of as an artist in terms of my process, but also kind of how I have um, grown to kind of go in all these different directions. So, I noticed um, nothing's up on the panel here. So if you could help me out by starting that and we can dim the lights. It's PC, I know nothing about PC. <laughs> yes, I see the clicker. Oh, oh, that's right, we discussed that. 
I'm not supposed to be looking at this. I thought I was going to be looking at a PowerPoint thing. Okay. Never mind. Um, so this is Waterbury, and the work kind of begins in my um, early interests really come out of film and photography, but wanting to kind of make works that, uh, in photography that seem to also come out of my interest in film. And I did these series of works in the early 80s where there's this uh, figure and her back is turned to the audience. And it's this kind of performative work about photography and how we look at it and how we kind of search for a meaning or search for the kind of photographer's um, insight or message in photography. And as a young person in undergraduate school and actually kind of showing uh, in exhibitions while I was in college, I really felt, and this is, I guess, early 80s, um, it's, or in late 70s, early 80s, that I was losing interest already in the medium in terms of the way that I, uh, in terms of exhibitions, but particularly documentary style photography. And not so much as a form did I find it uninteresting, but when I was included in different kinds of exhibitions that kind of treated it as a series of images by photographers on a particular kind of subject, I completely thought that something was wrong here or something was something else needed to be said about the way the viewer perceives photography and the way that they read, quote unquote, read images. Um, so this is called Water Bearer. It's done in 1985. And of course you can read, it says, she saw him disappear by the river. They asked her to tell what happened only to discount her memory. So memory and kind of this kind of collective memory or individual memory becomes really uh, very important in the work, I think throughout even to kind of to this day. And my voice in this was kind of to create a text that kind of mimics advertising in terms of the relationship to text and image, but also to kind of get the viewer questioning who this is, who, I, who am I talking about, and not in a kind of monolithic way in terms of black identity, but more questioning how we view one another and the specificity or the stereotypes that we kind of project or the stories that we project on the lives of different people. So, Again, in terms of memory, discounting of memory of different events that may happen to one, but that there, one does not have a voice or, or certain events are not acknowledged. 20 questions. And so this is like all work that's um, really early 80s. And my figuring out of kind of how to further this question of, okay, so you have these heads and using the mode of photography, which is about uh, multiplicity and reproduction, that the same head is repeated four times using this, uh, the premise of a parlor game called 20 Questions, a sampler, which is a parlor game like you have 20 opportunities to guess at the subject of what um, one of the players is um, kind of uh, suggesting within the game. And I have, is she as pretty as a pitcher or clear as crystal or pure as a lily or black as cold, or sharp as a razor, kind of all these uh, stereotypes and euphemisms about how you speak about women and kind of either their desire or their, or their personality or their appearance. But the question is never answered, really, because uh, A, the, uh, the guessing or trying to get at it is completely off base or is just based within uh, cliches and stereotypes. This is a Polaroid piece from 1998. 1998, um, stereo styles. And again, this repetition of uh, heads, but these heads are, this is also a Polaroid piece, so they're kind of unique uh, images. And the text that runs along the uh, middle is lifted from advertising that's kind of of women's ads, um, in terms of beauty ads, which read, daring, sensible, severe, long and silky, boyish, ageless, silly, magnetic, country, fresh, and sweet. So at this time, I'm really interested in kind of using uh, text either as these lines of just words that kind of become poetic, but also to kind of um, point to the way that we, the confines in terms of society of how we talk about women or how we speak about identity or sexuality in that way, and that it's also embedded in the language that we use. This is figure, and so from going from like one-liners to then kind of this repetition of the same word to kind of indicate, indicate um, social conditions or public, the difference between public and private lives. Um, 
figured the worst, figured all the times so there was no camera. He was disfigured, figured there would be no reaction. Um, God, I can't read it from over here, my eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> figured legality had nothing to do with it. Figured she was suspect, figured he was suspect. Figured someone had been there because the door was open. So this repetition of the word figure to kind of um, place the subject in this kind of public realm of the way that the subject is seen. So then I have an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago in the early 90s, of which um, Saidia Hartman, who is here tonight, um, was part of writing for that catalog along with um, Beryl Wright. And it was um, my first opportunity to have a major I don't want to use the word retrospective, but survey of my work, um, which would have been maybe about a 10-year period. And I remember walking into the galleries um, before the opening kind of by myself and realizing, wow, I'm not going to make this kind of work anymore. And not because I didn't like it and not because I didn't think it was important, but I kind of, to have all this work um, up on the walls, I really saw every avenue. I mean, you would think working on a catalog and having conversations that I would come to that realization, but in conversation, it expands what you think. But once you see all this work on a wall, it did make me think, wow, I think I need to um, shift the way that I am working just for myself in terms of process. So, I then start to make new rules for myself, rather than that there is a figure in a frame where the figure is turned away from the audience and that there's these um, different texts that operate in various ways, I decide, okay, no more figure. Take the figure out of the work. And so there's all these kind of logistics that happen in terms of the process of the work during this time that I am either limiting in order to expand. I'm kind of barricading off a certain way of working that I become um, familiar with and also my I would say, audience would recognize the work by particular devices to kind of completely walk away from that. So in doing so, I decided, okay, but I can use a surrogate. <laughs> and that brings to this piece called Wigs. And the idea came from just a thinking of adornment and hair and identity in the way that how one presents oneself is um, linked very much to who one is in a very interior kind of way. So I went to, I live in Brooklyn, I went to Fulton Mall, which at that time it's changed a little bit now, but at that particular time there were about a hundred wig shops all up and down Fulton. Now see, there, there are Brooklynites here that know what I'm talking about. And I was just like, it, it was interesting because I could just go, you know, try to find the most unique wig out of each shop. Um, and there was a lot of variety. Um, and then took them back to my home. At that time, I didn't really even have a studio and pinned them on my bedroom wall and then photographed them. And then they get silk screened onto this felt material. So let me go in. And it was this way of talking about you know, hair or kind of these extensions or these parts as bits and parts of an identity. So the text um, goes back and forth between, like, this is a text that reflects a conversation between a sociologist and a very concerned mother who is very concerned about her son's behavior and attraction to mannequins and putting on stockings and the, what kind of, kind of comes uh, to the front of the conversation or kind of really what's at the foreground is the mother's anxiety and nothing about the child really, but the mother's anxiety in and around gender and how her anxiety translates or, to, or she's trying to dictate the identity of that child. Um, in detail. Another one, wig produced a desire text. So a lot of it, I mean, it has to do um, with the politics of appearance. And so therefore, like um, the runaway slaves of craft who kind of make their way north by the wife pretending to be an elderly white man who is sick. I'm sure everyone here knows that story. And, um, accompanied by her husband who is darker skinned and he pretends to be her slave and they kind of switch these gender and um, identity roles in order to make their escape. But in that as the political kind of um, impetus be behind one's shifting of appearance but also out of desire of one's um, desire to appear a certain way and kind of societal, um, oops wrong, going ahead of myself, societal 
obsessions with identity in terms of one's sexuality, of how one lives their lives, and kind of what their post-mortem uh, uh, examinations determine in terms of who they are as people in terms of gender. So I was in wigs, which was um, important for me for the time, was trying to talk about it as much as, as a determination of um, self-determination in terms of identity and not one that is assigned by society. So this is called, I'm oh, so glad the text is in here this time, Nine Props. And in this moment of wanting to um, try different things, I decided to, I was invited uh, by Pilchuck, which is a glass school in Seattle, to spend a couple of weeks working with a gaffer. Um, and it was perfect for me because I was like, I don't know what the hell I would do with that. I should go. And so I go and I get there and I'm really kind of, my God, it's like being surrounded by pyromaniacs who have found their calling, who are like literally, yes, the glory hole of fire. Everyone is sitting around the fire, working with the fire, pouring things into molds, you know, molten, fire, molten glass. And I was just really kind of um, entertained, I'll say. By, by this. But at the same time, I was there to work. So, I, you know, the gaffer was like one of the, a really great guy can kind of make anything that I want. Um, I was kind of unprepared for the kind of level of theater that the glass world um, has. So I went back into Seattle, which is about an hour and a half. This pill check is outside of Seattle. It's about an hour and a half drive um, to go to a bookstore to find a book by Deborah Willis uh, Thomas about James Vanderzee, which I even had at home back in New York. And I just said to myself, Eureka, I'll just have them blow vases that are props out of James Vanderzee's photographs. So I come back really excited, and they looked at me like, really? <laughs> <laughs> really? About, you know, a simple vase? Um, I, but I was very excited and like drew it on the, like, you know, they have you do drawings on the concrete floor so that they can, you know, it was, it was comical. But it was one of the most interesting pieces because I do not consider myself a sculptor yet, or I haven't really done that. Um, but to kind of work in that way, I do love glassware. So I was like, I'll figure out how to do that. So after about $1,000 later to ship back all that glassware, which I didn't realize in the making of all of it. Uh, <laughs> Um, I had these objects that I brought back to my studio and realized this is really about photography since it is about James Van Der Zee. So this is Belle of the Ball and with the vase that you see on her left, <laughs> to think for a second, and then um, a text that kind of talks about the photograph in terms of its description and its detail, and that James Van Der Zee's kind of amazing attention to detail, but also aspiration and effect. Um, his photographs are completely orchestrated in a way that are quite beautiful. This is Benny Andrews, the vase that's holding the chrysanthemums. Uh, reclining nude, and that's the vase that goes with that, al along with, again, um, kind of detailed descriptions in my kind of art historical read about the photograph. So those pieces, which I should go back for one second, are on felt, much like wigs, and so is this. And in the way that I work, there's something that I love about a grid. I can't, don't get away from it, I always have it. it you know, sometimes there's an entire image, but a lot of the times things are broken up into grids and parts. And this is from a video, but it's, it's a still from a video um, called Recollection, I think, um, that was shot in Columbus, Ohio. But it has text throughout it about couples meeting in this uh, landscape. And in the video, they kind of appear and disappear, and there's kind of different activities that take place, as in, much, as, as in many parks all over the world, um, in terms of encounters. And that sort of um, this piece and in and around that time, I developed this whole kind of body of work that's called public sex. And it comes about also um, in kind of doing photography, but doing all the stage photography, at the same time traveling for exhibitions or um, for pleasure, 
um, I found myself kind of all over the world, which was great. And I would carry this kind of two and a quarter camera with me to make sure, you know, at that time there wasn't really cell phones with a great um, picture that we have now. But um, in order to force myself, because if you carry a, a Hasselblad with you places and you don't take pictures, you feel like a fool because it's so heavy and cumbersome. It's ridiculous not to spend the time to actually use it. Um, so this is called the car and was taken um, somewhere in north of Italy. And it's a description of two people having sex in the car, but the kind of echo that happens within this uh, chamber. Um, and that's the, so each one has a text panel. It's much more story oriented. That's called the cloud, which is a little bit out of sequence. But here are, they are kind of at the house to Kunst um, from last year. Um, kind of lined up. So they're very large scale kind of uh, works. That's the rock. That's the clock. So for me in taking these pictures, like a lot of them were taken with no, I would travel and just take pictures just to be taking pictures with assigning no need to them, but as a kind of thing to do because I love photography and as a way to not be on a deadline or not have to kind of always be working towards something, but just uh, doing just kind of freely photographing and that created like these huge albums of just images and most of them are not populated with people so I realized in coming up with this idea about these kind of public areas that are and sometimes uh, very public and have a particular um, activity or purpose that by a certain time of day or access level they become something else by the user or by people uh, from a particular uh, area or in terms of time of day. And that's like an office building, Madison Park in New York, and kind of um, different floors being worked on in terms of construction and which floors are vacant. And so a lot of the works are about conversations about where to have sex, not so much the sex itself, but the negotiation around the space. So now I come to... Um, Film. And this is um, a piece uh, called Corridor, which also another person who's in the exhibition. This is Wageshi Mutu. So at this time, like this is 2003, kind of a little bit before, for about maybe five months before that, she was helping me with a catalog, a Fiden book that was being done. And we were kind of amassing um, just information for, I don't know, the index in terms of reviews and articles on the work. And I had this opportunity through, what is it called, um, Mass Mocha and the Society for the Preservation of, Antu of New England Antiquities. And it was kind of, I mean, much like the building that you guys have here um, that's part of uh, the art history and art department, it's a big mill. Um, and so each artist had like something like 2,000 square feet and you were supposed to go through this society's warehouse, much like the, um, his New York Historical Society, where they just have cataloged ephemera from the 1700s of New England that people kind of just give to them, which I just found to be, I couldn't take it, because I used to work at the Historical Society in Yonkers in the dead of winter in a warehouse cataloging things. <laughs> and it kind of brought that memory back. And although me and my friends would be like, they'd never miss the cannonball. We could take the cannonball. They'd never miss it. We could take all, you know, like all those glass negatives. Who wants all those boxes? But we never, we never stole anything. But that kind of kept it lively to talk about <laughs> what you would steal and what you found. Like they'd never miss it, kind of thing. So going, through, you know, like the idea of creating a room of thousands of objects was just like, no, I can't do that. Um, but. At that point, I think um, right at kind of at that same time, my father had died. And then I was really done. I was like, I am not doing anything I don't want to do. Forget this. Um, and in having the conversation on the phone with them about not wanting to do it, they were like begging me, like, oh, please, don't pull out. Come on, there's no one thing. And I said, OK, I'll just look at As I was talking to them, I said, yeah. And I'm like looking through the catalog. And I open it up, and I go, but wait a minute, you have architecture. And they go, yeah. I said, well, I want to do something at the Walter Gropius home, which is the image on the uh, right. And then they got, you know, attitude like, oh, well, you know, but those are homes for preservation. 
I go, you can't bring a film crew in there. I was like, okay, then I'm done. <laughs> so we negotiated finally, and they allowed me to film within Walter Gropius' home, which is on Walden Pond that he bought, um, excuse me, built for his family in the 40s, which kind of, you know, by the time, it's kind of preserved in a very 1967. I mean, it had. Some, I was so happy it had the same kind of towels I had in my bathroom when I was a child. I was like, oh my God, those brown and black towels. We had the same ones. Um, and on the left is um, the Coffin House, which is a kind of late 1700s house, but it too, kind of the American vernacular of building on and additions and shifting, looks like an 1860s house. So my idea, because I live in a 1860s house um, in Brooklyn, although there's not one bit of detail left um, in it, would be this interesting idea of these two points in history, um, pre-emancipation and the kind of last part of the civil rights era, and kind of what would be these two different um, environments, but taking the minutia of the day-to-day -day of this woman's life, um, kind of their soundtrack, but uh, just following her through one day. So Swagishi Mutu plays both characters, and it's kind of a split-screen film, and that's kind of it moving into the evening, so as a kind of indentured servant or, because it's Boston, runaway slave, but riding at night kind of secretly or waiting um, in her modernist home uh, at the end of the evening uh, for someone to arrive. So if you lower this light.
turn it off off. How do I put it on pause? Um, so, Corridor is a film, I mean, it also has a soundtrack, and the soundtrack is um, Blind Tom's compositions, which are going to come French nocturnes to, as you can hear, Dixie and uh, kind of typical Americana. But his um, compositions, in terms, of, they're played by Nurit uh, Tillis. They're quite dark and kind of the momentum in them are very, the momentum pace, but also the color of his music is also very dark and kind of disturbing. And that's paired with um, Albert Eiler. So I thought kind of these two um, composers at this point, at these two different points in time shared a lot in terms of the way that they um, composed music and the kind of the rhythm of it. And I thought it was a kind of interesting quote unquote mix of those two, uh, century apart, two different composers. And so it kind of goes on uh, and on into the evening of just the routine of the day-to-day -day and walking throughout these architectural spaces. But um, I would say it's kind of inspired by who, uh, by, um, Chantelle Ackerman, who died a few weeks ago, a French filmmaker, who, um, whose film, Jean Dielman, and it kind of has the address, something, something, Brussels, um, is an amazing film to me cause I, that I saw while I was in graduate school in California uh, for the first time. But in this kind of descriptive, slow-paced, day-to-day operation of one's, uh, of one's activities as a way to begin to tell a story or to point to what might be the psychological state of the subject. Um, is what inspires uh, Corridor. So, I see. I guess I can't control. Can I put that on pause for a second? Um, so, I then, thank you, I wanted to um, make these another video piece because I do love music um, and kind of grew up listening to jazz and from my parents. Um, so it's kind of when that surrounds you every day of listening to music, it becomes part of you. But I wouldn't say that I'm a musician <laughs> at all. But I do love also the kind of uh, the body as, as a mechanism to make music, uh, of course. And I decided to do this piece of having, I kind of did a casting call in Columbus, Ohio, of as many people that I could find that were singers, which there's a big acting community there. And I got nine people, and I also included myself to kind of make it a little broader, although I can't really hum that well. But listening to John Coltrane's um, rendition of Easy to Remember, which is a Rogers and Hart uh, composition. And what was interesting about that was that they had a hard time, like one had to really listen to it a few times in order to find one's octave place in that. So we had everyone from baritones to alto to kind of a big range of different voices for this piece. Um, but the funny thing about it in that, one of the women who is uh, like really, really high pitched, pitched uh, voice, because we're shooting in a sound room and it's like you know maybe five or six people in the crew and a camera that has a giant lens that's maybe about 10 inches from her face. And as we're shooting, the sound person says to me, okay, we need to stop. And usually that means, oh, there's a garbage truck backing up outside, or there's other things that they can hear that you can't, you know, of ambient sound that's taking place outside. And he got up and walked over to me though. I was like, okay, is he gonna tell me that the digital machine is broken or, and he just said, her heartbeat is louder than her humming, <laughs> which I thought was really beautiful and kind of terrifying at the same time, so, um, which could, should be another piece in that somehow. Um, but it was a really interesting experience to, to have singers try to hum something uh, and musically by listening to it that has all these different flows and kind of levels of uh, what is a very standard melody. So now I'll play, please. Oops.
next one. So then I also wanted to, um, oops, I'm not, not going to do that. I wanted to make another piece that had to do with kind of mission of sound and music from the body and decided to collaborate with a dear friend, Terry Atkins. Um, and we made this piece called um, Cloudscape. Let me see if it comes up. Can I put that on hold? pause for a second? Um, and it's shot in an empty space, but Terry and I, mm -hmm. uh, I know, I don't, I used to like play the violin when I was a kid, of course, don't remember any of that anymore. Um, <laughs> but found, pause please, um, this way of looking through a music sheet of um, spirituals uh, from the turn of the century or kind of late 1800s. Um, but wanted to choose something that we didn't quite re recognize, but that had a really interesting loop to it. Um, and so Terry died a, a couple of years, now a year and a half ago, um, and is a very dear uh, friend, and our daughters are very close friends since they, their birth. But it was an amazing opportunity to kind of use, he was a musician and visual artist, and to collaborate with him on this piece was amazing. Okay, now I'm ready to play. Thank you. So as you can see, it kind of goes in reverse and becomes a different tune. The musical quality of it shifts because it's all put in reverse, kind of amplified by the fog uh, dissipating um, as well. So this is momentum. Um, I then uh, have this memory in my mind, which I think kind of is the beginning of my idea of who I was as a young person. 
And I think around the age of 11 years old, I was studying ballet and really loved um, classical ballet kind of on point. And I went to Bernice J Johnson Dance Studio, which is a black dance school in Queens, which is a feeder school for Alvin Ailey. And does somebody know that? Yes, yes! <laughs> it's fabulous, wasn't it? To make them all, yes! <laughs> So you're gonna love this. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was really, it was great because I loved the camaraderie of dancers. I loved the idea of um, going to rehearsals, performing in front of the mirror, you know, becoming stronger, you know, as a young woman and kind of this thing that's created, particularly in a black dance school, was really amazing to me. And so we get our costumes, which is a gold afro, a bodysuit. And, black, and spray paint to paint our afros and our toe shoes. And it's taking place at Lincoln Center when Lincoln Center is kind of bright and shiny. And we are to dance this composition to Duke Ellington's Sophisticated Lady. Now, what we didn't understand was kind of how all this costume fit together. And so when we get to the... Um, you know, uh, backstage, you go into the dressing rooms at Lincoln Center, which are like bright and shiny, beautiful, kind of amazing, which was also the kind of great thing about this kind of ownership of an institution um, as a young New Yorker um, by this kind of um, experience afforded by this dance school, was that I realized we were wearing basically gold body paint with very thin leotards and gold afros and toe shoes. It was like Vegas. <laughs> we were even like shocked, you know, because I mean, we were 11 and 12 and your bodies are kind of starting to develop and we were just like, oh my God. I mean, I remember that moment standing there, like everyone just looking at each other, being a bit kind of, okay, we're doing this. <laughs> I don't know what the audience thought, but I kind of thought it was <laughs> amazing. Um, and we get out. And my only concern on going on stage was, okay, hit my mark, but not to fall out of my pirouettes. And so, so long as I could get through that, I knew that I would be fine. And the shocking thing to me was like coming out on stage, um, I guess at Avery Fisher Hall and looking into the audience, I immediately said to myself, this is not for me. Because I wanted to be in the audience. I really wanted to see this performance. I really got no pleasure from the anxiety of trying to perform pirouettes. <laughs> and it was also like Duke Ellington had died, I, th I think a week before, so it was also like a tribute now to Duke Ellington. Um, and I went out of there just like, okay, that was really all that work that was really underwhelming. I was kind of shocked, because um, I thought of myself as part of that dance world. Um, so then my parents, uh, for some reason, kind of, you know, of course, it's, you know, this is the 70s, so, you know, they take the film to the drugstore, comes back <laughs> weeks later, I look at it, and it's like the, it, on a blue inky sea, little yellow f goldish figures that are like this teeny, and I was so devastated. I was like, oh my God, no documentation. Because <laughs> to me, it was the most amazing thing in the world. How can there be no documentation? So that haunted me, you know, many, many, you know, I'm like, God, 2001, 51 years old, I'm still thinking about that shit. <laughs> so I just said to myself, you know, you just gotta stop, just gotta make a piece. So I did a casting call in New York of young dancers between the ages of like, I don't know, 15, 15 and 25. And it didn't matter in terms of your skill, just, I kind of hired everybody. Um, and they were young and they had never, many of them had never been paid um, to perform. So it was the first time they'd been, uh, for the day, they'd never been paid um, for a performance. And what I had them do were pirouettes and kind of continue these pirouettes until they would fall out of them and then someone would replace them. So it was my kind of version of the choreography. But I had the pleasure of watching them all get gold body paint spray painting, their gold afros. So it was this kind of interior pleasure of mine to be able to kind of recreate this experience for myself and to make, okay, finally I have evidence of what that shit looked like. Because <laughs> you know, 
1971, Lincoln Center, this was hot. <laughs> so this is um, a kind of clip from Momentum. And, when I, and so it doesn't have a soundtrack. It's kind of, the soundtrack is the sound of their feet um, and kind of the momentum that's created, just the sound of the floor. Um, so I don't know if, how loud that will be for this. But they're to kind of keep spinning and spinning and then every, the next person takes over and there are different people who have different levels of, um, of skill, of course. And then it's kind of speeded up in terms of editing to go faster and faster and faster. Um, but I get a lot of pleasure. That's like a completely personal piece. And if you didn't go to <laughs> Bernice Johnson dance studio, it won't make any sense. It'll make one sense to one person in this audience. <laughs> and that's enough for me. Okay, so I'll go on. Um, so this is kind of um, also like um, the image that's on the brochure for this evening's event. And it's, um, please remind me of who I am, uh, it's photo booths. And I would collect these images from uh, auction sites, flea markets, let me see if I can get a detail. And kind of just all these discarded images that basically to me from this era, uh, a photo booth is kind of all these self-portraits that people make um, as identification, like for passport or for work, or, but, but also to send with notes as a message as to where you're going, how well you're doing. Even if you weren't doing well, you looked good in your photo booth image. Um, and so about aspiration and kind of how people wanted to present themselves, whether there's any quote unquote truth in it or that it reveals actually where they are, it kind of is a signal as to where they wanted to be. Um, that I find quite beautiful. Um, so they're framed in kind of these bronze frames with drawings and little ink uh, things that kind of go with them. And then, and also these uh, bronze blanks that are kind of placeholders for other I missing images. Um, so there are, serious, there are a lot of photo booth pieces that I've done over the years in collecting them. And, reframing framing them and, and kind of representing them. But in that vein of kind of reframing and um, repositioning, there's this piece called 1957-2009, where in my search for photo booths images, I come by not this particular image, but an image of a woman, this woman, don't know who she is, on eBay. And she is leaning against a car. And I go, okay, that's amazing. Kind of in this very coquettish uh, pinup kind of uh, stance. And the seller then, after I buy a couple of the images that he has online, he goes, well, I have about 250 of these images. Are you inter interested in buying the lot? And I was like, yeah. And so I bought them, took them back to the studio, and it was literally kind of, you know, if you say kind of Andy Warhol's uh, screen tests or, you know, a kind of... Um, portfolio of images for someone who has a desire to be in modeling or a, uh, act or being an actress, this was it. And they're all kind of, they have little labels in them that say Los Angeles, um, 1957, between the months of July, no, June and August. And so I pinned them up in my studio and thought, how fantastic is this? I mean, I was just blown away by this project, by this woman from that era, um, especially in terms of thinking of Hollywood and actresses at that time, or even modeling, about her desire in creating this, this kind of project for this particular period of time. There's also a man that appears in these pictures, kind of as the photographer, which he is not, but that the narrative that's contained within all the images is that he's kind of the photographer and the artist, and like she's the muse, this whole narrative that is completely just built around the photography. But these two images of them playing chess, um, so let me go back. So it turns out, into, it turns into this uh, photographic project that turns into 300 images where I imitate both of them. I kind of take her stance, her body positions. I don't think I have um, details of that. Um, and I insert myself like a doppelganger 
into all the pho in, next to all the photographs and kind of expand the project of both um, her and him. It turned out to be such a great project that I hate it because I have, you know, one has always rules for themselves and kind of having all those images pinned up in my studio, I thought, um, you know, it would be so great if, if someone mimicked her in the pictures to kind of present them again in a way, to kind of give them a different angle about this idea of, you know, what, how truthful or what the photograph contains about it. Because I know nothing about her, nor do I learn anything more about her, nor do you learn anything about me in looking at me, you know, imitating her. So it's this thing about how photography works in this way as a disguise at the same time, or as this narrative that is to be presented um, and not to be something that is a kind of psychological portrait. Um, and so the, what captivated me, I said, okay, there's got to be another piece in here after kind of doing that huge project. And I thought these two images were really interesting, that they were both separate but playing chess by themselves. So I thought, what would be more boring, since I do kind of, you know, works that are kind of about the minutia of one's day to day, that two people are playing chess against themselves? Like, how would you film that and make that interesting? And so these are, oh, I do have some details of some of the images. And so in thinking about that, and because you know, my insertion of myself into this project is like mirroring her and him in terms of their gesture and kind of the way that they operate within the images. And that was, this is kind of an image that I found, again, like I could collect photography on various um, auction sites, so the cyanotype of this trick photography where this young woman is taking a picture of herself. And kind of at the time, you know, in kind of the early 1900s, there's a lot of trick photography that happens. And in describing this project that, yeah, I'm going to make this film, but it's kind of, um, they're going to be two characters, but, you know, I'm mirroring them, so there has to be something about mirrors in it. Every time I would describe that to a curator or have a conversation, everyone would bring up um, of this type of image, which is the five-way portrait um, that's of Duchamp and Picabia, um, of both separately. And I would just like roll my eyes and go, yeah, yeah, I know, Duchamp, I know, the five-way portrait. Okay, I got it. Yes, I know, Picabia did. And they're all taken by the same photo anonymous photographer in 1911. Until one person, another writer that I'm having a conversation with, says, but have you seen this image? And she shows me this image of this black man. <laughs> And then I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> I'll do it in that way. I don't want the Duchamp reference, but this kind of killed me, this image. So I decided to recreate this, which is a very simple thing of um, using mirrors at kind of like 70 degrees. You place a person or an object in front of it. And the uncanny thing that happens is that, and this is kind of us setting up and me as the male character being made up, is that what is striking about the relationship of the mirrors is that, the, as opposed to a kind of Hitchcock, you know, infinity or Yayo Kusama <laughs> infinity image, is that the images are not symmetrical. So it kind of appears a little bit like there's several different characters that look similar because the images are not, in relationship to one another, are not symmetrical. So that's kind of a still. And in making this up, I have two friends, um, one woman whose name I can't remember who did my makeup, but a friend of mine named Idris Nichols um, did the hair, and we had these wigs that um, I would put on and kind of, you know, get all made up for it to look all seamless. And they are both of Caribbean background, as so am I. And so as we're doing it, because we're doing it in my studio, and I'm being very good, like, you know, they're doing it, and then he said, okay, now you can go look in the mirror. I look in the mirror, and I look just like my father. I mean, so shockingly so that I pull out from, like, he had died maybe eight or nine years before that. So I have this, in my, you know, hidden in my studio, I have this giant portrait that we had at the memorial service, and I pull it out, and they both look at me, okay, God, please put that away. <laughs> You're conjuring your father? We don't need that on this set. Let's just keep this, what this is supposed to be. <laughs> but it was really striking. Um, and that's me. It's a kind of Tina Turner at this point in the thing, kind of look. Um, so now I'll show chess. But it was, an, so in that also, um, I wanted to, I, I've been talking to Jason Moran, and we've been trying to figure out a project in terms of collaboration. And in the idea of mirroring, um, I wanted to, 
a composition that, to work with him with a composition that where the hands would mirror one another, meaning that as you play, um, both hands are in unison. Um, and so we talked about different things and then we kind of just left it like that. And one day he showed up to the studio. We had after shoot, the day after shooting this, we uh, adjusted the set so that um, the upright baby grand piano kind of in the middle of two mirrors and then created his sequence as well. And that's Jason Moran playing as part of the video. So now, okay, this, so this is an excerpt because it's kind of hard architecturally to see it linearly. So I had a whole thing of like, had a chess wrangler, we had a script for how to play. So it's actually a game where, of course, the female character wins in checkmate. <laughs> but of course, I'm playing against myself, so. Um, but it was interesting because the thoughtfulness really is like, okay, count the spaces. Okay, that's a pawn. Okay, that's a king. <laughs> and trying to figure out how to move the pieces uh, in a realistic fashion. Characters also age over the course of time of them playing the game. So yeah, it was a whole lot to make that kind of happen in a uh, sh short period of time. But particularly the aging male character really does look like my dad. So it's kind of hard to show this because the architecturally the room that it's um, made in is made to kind of foreshorten very quickly kind of um, uh, the space, so it's hard to get a, a video of, kind of how it works. <coughs> so we're almost done. I also have been involved in making drawings and collages, which I'll kind of just go through. Now this is a series of collages at the House to Kunst. Um, and it's been really interesting to kind of play with ink and over the course of time, I mean, I know so many amazing painters that I never feel comfortable saying like that I would even attempt that. But I, in being invited to make a proposal, I'll say, to Oakley and Wazor for the Venice Biennale, I just said, okay, I'm going to make some works on Gesso. <laughs> 
and came up with these works, um, and he chose four of them for the Venice Biennale. But it was the first time that I had worked kind of in painting since I had been in art school, which was kind of terrifying and freeing at the same time. And I think as an artist, in terms of process, I really enjoy um, kind of new territory and trying to figure out what I'm doing and how I'm working. So that was biting off a lot, but it was really interesting um, process. So this is one called Three Figures. Uh, that's a silkscreen on gesso board with ink um, from the kind of civil rights image uh, that everyone is familiar with, um, but kind of then realigning it or misaligning parts of that image of people being hosed down during uh, protests. It's called Nightmare, which again, it's, some of these are based on collages and photographic images. Slip. True Value. Right back at you. And this is really, it's called Dark and Staircase, kind of a small-ish painting. And move, Movableness. Again, another photo, this is kind of silkscreen and ink on for it. The end.